Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Kanish Chuk, thanks for joining me on the podcast again. No, thank you for having me, Owen. It's always a pleasure to come on and talk ETFs with you, uh, to talk investing. This time we're talking a mega trend, which is battery supply. And in particular, we're going to call out the ACDC ETF, which is one of the ETFs from the range of ETF securities, ETFs that you manage. I think a really good way to set the scene for ACDC is to just, maybe we can start at the beginning. People may have come across the ticket code. It's got a bit of a fun ticket code, but maybe I'll just hand it over to you to give us a bit of background into, you know, I guess, renewable energy and battery storage in particular and how that market has evolved. And then we'll talk about some of the, I guess, the more intricacies of of what's actually inside the ETF. Yeah, definitely. So it's funny, I think what you mentioned, we've had this ETF now out since August 2018 and is covering the broader spectrum of the mega trend of battery technology and also lithium as well. So people will we'll run into that in a bit more detail later, but people need to be aware that it's not just the technology side, it's also the resource aspect as well. But taking a step back, you know, batteries and the industry of what batteries is, I was actually looking at some research and the oldest found battery was called the Baghdad battery. It's um, found, it was you know, from 2000 years ago, it was basically a ceramic pot battery. Um, there's still not much known um, specifically around, you know, what it was used for, but that is in theory the world's first battery. The time that the term battery was first used was actually Benjamin Franklin used it in 1749 when he was doing experiments with electricity. And the first true battery was in 1800 by an Italian physicist, Alessandro Volta. So it was only until 1980 that you actually had this American physicist by the name of Professor John Goodenough, and he invented a new type of lithium battery. And, you know, obviously we'll talk about why lithium is really now the future of battery technology. But if you take that 2,000 years, essentially, it's a bit of a slow, innovative um, sort of journey. But since 1980 and since 1991, which is when Sony commercialized the first lithium battery, you've really seen this massive sort of innovation that's occurred around battery technology and specifically also on the lithium side. Now, why is that? So why have we just seen this big push? I think there's two reasons for this. One, there is this big push not only from consumers, but also from governments and corporations as well to look at more renewable sources of energy and batteries comes into that so trying to move away from oil coal power plants etc and finding new technologies and ways in which you know we'll talk about the paris agreement or you know to try to really consider what is going to be you know the most sustainable future for for the world and batteries is really going to be the focus of that and that's why we've been seeing this big i guess push on the innovation side the other aspect is as you've seen more technology in the battery side really grown you've actually seen great uses of battery technology so when sony first launched the first lithium battery essentially it was mainly used in Discman's, as you and you and I may, may know of them, people that are listening to this fast card may not know what a Discman is, but MP3 players, cell phones at the time, laptops, so small battery cells. And if you think about how much a cell phone uses or how much a laptop uses, it's essentially a laptop is using about 50 watts, watt hours. Now, as the technology has improved and the storage of lithium, the density or the, the size of the lithium batteries, the, the life of them as well, and the recharging aspects So this. We'll talk about the value chain soon, but uh, an electric vehicle uses about 40 kilowatt hours, so 40,000 watt hours. So a massive jump up, but that's what we've seen is that evolution in the 
battery technology industry uh, and the battery technology side. So it's, it's slowly moved away from just being, you know, if you looked around your room right now and even someone that's listening to this podcast, they're going to be listening to it on the phone. So they're using a lithium battery. But we're just at this inflection point of what the, um, the market can look like. So my understanding from what you just said there, Kinesh, is effectively the battery technology driven by lithium has actually become more efficient and more effective while at the same time it's being used in more devices and more applications. Exactly right. So we're looking at some research in terms of what the size of the, of the market is as well. If you take it back a step and you go, well, the entire battery market in 2019, it's valued about $110 billion US dollars. Now, the lithium battery market in 2019 was about $36, $37 billion US dollars. If you look forward it by, you know, sort of 2027, for example, we're expected to be the total battery market will be about 310 billion. And the lithium battery, so the lithium portion of that, will be about 130 billion. And they're running so that the total battery market that's running about a 14% compounded annual growth rate. And the lithium is running at about an 18% compounded annual growth rate from 2020 to 2027. That may actually be less than what it will end up because simply being this big push that we're currently got at the moment towards sort of green solutions, green projects, you know, especially with Biden coming in as well and his big focus of trying to revolutionise this entire industry as well. It's one of those things where I think as human beings, we often underestimate the ability for things to change, especially when there's compounding involved. How, you know, what that figure in 2027 ends up being is, could be radically different. My perception would be that it would be a bigger number than p- perhaps even what some of the researchers are considering, just simply because even um, like anecdotes around me would be that friends and family are asking about these things now more than ever. Um, and then on the investment side, one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, talking about the uh, ACDC ETF, talking about ethical ETFs with a particular focus on sustainability. And so we're getting it from almost every angle, was consumers, businesses, government, and investors, everyone is, every stakeholder is pushing for this. So it's a really interesting industry. Kinnis, we talked a bit off air about, and you alluded to it there, about lithium being potentially a better source of energy than for batteries than what we've seen in the past. I'm not sure if you know much about this, but maybe if you can shed any light on the difference or you know why lithium is the choice for many smartphones and, and different products these days? So I guess lithium ion batteries, they have the highest charge density of any comparable system. So essentially what that means is they give you a ton of energy without being very heavy. So that's really what it comes down to. So when you're talking about carrying your phone, you don't want your phone to be weighing one kilo, for example. That's not going to make it portable. When you're driving a vehicle, you want it to have the most power and the longest storage of energy. So I've never driven a Tesla myself, um, but from watching, you know, Top Gear and et cetera, and from seeing it, people that, you know, drive a Tesla and say that that ludicrous mode where some of the Teslas now can do sort of zero to 100 kilometers in sort of sub three seconds, which is extremely fast at sort of Formula One sort of speeds, that is really only possible from the use of a lithium battery. So it can provide that real big source of power. But now as the technology is improving, you can actually have a a Tesla at the moment where you don't need to charge it every day. It can run for sort of 300 miles, for example, 200, 275 miles, I think, is the capacity, depending upon the type of Tesla you get in the long range, et cetera. So that's sort of what we're looking at. Lithium is the highest charge density, so it gives you a ton of energy, not very heavy. When you consider cobalt and nickel and the other types of technology that exist, there are certain limitations with some technologies um, and cobalt is, a, is one in particular. So cobalt is a natural material. It's very, very short in supply. It's only found in a few places on earth and obviously because of its use within the chemical compound that makes up lithium batteries, it actually is seeing its demand rising. So prices of cobalt is really increasing. There's a bit of a concern around the supply of cobalt, for example, or even nickel. And what you're actually seeing, and Tesla, Elon Musk came out last year 
creating you know the first Tesla vehicle that wasn't using cobalt in its battery at all, and that was for just a Model Three in China. So you're starting to see developments in terms of trying to phase out some of these materials so that they're not as reliant upon them. And that's probably one of the things we've seen is the reason why the adoption of electric vehicles, which really is going to drive most of the battery sort of technology space and the battery demand looking forward for the next 20 or 30 years, has been slightly slower than what experts may have felt, you know, have wanted is because of the cost. And it's really the the initial drive away cost that when you walk into a dealership and you say, yep, sweet, I'm going to buy this battery electric vehicle. But the cost is quite high. And it's because of some of these inputs such as cobalt and the price of cobalt really rising. Yeah, I have noticed that I have friends and family who have even looked not so much with the automotive side, but just to, with their off-grid housing, just trying to put a battery alongside their solar panels is often it is the most costly part of the whole setup so they've almost been put off by how expensive it can be but you mentioned something earlier on there Kanish I think you talked about the value chain when it comes to battery technology and lithium can you explain what you mean and because I think this is going to tie in nicely with the ACDC ETF is kind of that how does the battery become a battery and then who are the key key players in that space and how can we as investors profit, I guess, is where we're going. Yeah, definitely. So think of the battery value chain. It's made up of a number of different industries across the globe. So start at the at the, the beginning, you need the mining and the chemical industry. So these are the ones that are producing your raw materials to actually manufacture the battery cell components. So That is companies in Australia has a number of these and within our ETF, ACDC, we actually have a few lithium mining companies within the, within the portfolio. So things, uh, companies like Galaxy Resources, Pilbara, et cetera, they are companies at the raw material stage. Then you start to progress forward and you've got the manufacturing. So they're processing the materials, they're putting them into the cells and the packs that are actually producing and manufacturing the actual batteries side of it. So the actual, lithium batteries. So that's companies like Samsung SDI, LG Chem, for example. Then you've got the application. So the production and the end use. So we all know Tesla, and they're probably one of the leaders in this space in terms of obtaining battery technology and batteries from other companies such as LG Chemical or Samsung SDI, utilizing that and putting it into their vehicles and producing the, one of the, you know, the world's most popular electric vehicle. But it's not just Tesla that is looking at the application side. So you've actually got companies, and I can run through a few later on, but a company like Renault, for example, is actually taking over in terms of electric vehicle sales in Europe from Tesla because they're doing a lot more work in this particular space. So within our ETF, we don't just have Tesla. Tesla's actually only about 45 5% of the portfolio at the moment, and that's obviously partly because of the price sort of move that it's had since the latest portfolio rebalance in November. But we've got companies like BMW, Renault, Toyota, et cetera, that are in that portfolio that are in that application stage. So, Kinesh, can I interrupt for a second? Because I think we've talked about this on the show before, but what would be your advice if someone says to you, well, why don't I just go buy Tesla shares instead of the ACDC ETF? Because, I mean, that's kind of the, the belief <laughs> among some people, right, that they, yeah. that they would do that. And I think for there's a single stock risk that would apply to that. So Tesla, obviously, over a 12-month period has done very well. But there have been moments, days or a week or a month where the price of Tesla may not have done and have not have, not have, may not have performed as well as you would have hoped or there may have been negative performance. There is some volatility that is attached to having single stocks. For us, the idea of diversification is really important and that's why an ETF is providing a solution for that because you essentially are buying the whole megatrend. You're not buying a single stock. Something that we firmly believe in at ETF Spheres is don't pick the winner or or loser. Pick the megatrend, pick the basket. That is where you may not get a 1,000% increase in your portfolio holding of ACDC, you know, last year alone, it did nearly 60, 65% returns, but you're not going to have that volatility. So what we saw is a number of the stocks that we hold in the portfolio really were hurt during COVID and that February, March drop 
last year in 2020. But the actual port ACDC ETF was did fairly well comparatively. The the drop is you're essentially protecting yourself on that on that decline by looking at a diversified basket. Obviously, you're giving some of that upside performance, that alpha, as you would call it. So what I would say to those people that say, why don't I just buy Tesla? Well, there's probably just an element of risk that's involved in buying a single stock and taking maybe an exposure into a diversified basket. If this is a particular mega trend that you're looking at, well, then the ACDC ETF may suit. And if you're still wanting to be very bullish on Tesla, for example, you can take an overweight into that by buying the single stock, but it may not be the major part of your portfolio. It's interesting, right? Because with our subscription service, our RASC ETF subscription service, we've actually got a thematic portfolio. And I'm just looking at it now. And Max, who is our former ETF analyst, he said that one of the, the key benefits of the ACDC ETF is that if the price of lithium falls, and it's very volatile, the, the actual commodity price, if the price falls, then that can be bad for miners in the short term, but it can actually be good for the end users and the companies that use the lithium to put into their batteries, and therefore they'll create more profits. So it's kind of got this balancing effect, which I personally hadn't thought of. So not only do you minimize that stock-specific risk, but you also get the, the benefit of perhaps, because it's right through the value chain, you get that kind of blend across both ends of it, if you like. And you, you did actually see that. So in 2016 to 2000, or 2017, 18, and sort of 19 as well, there was this big um, price pressure on lithium. So there was an oversupply, there was a pressure on the price, and you actually saw a number of lithium miners get to that brink of bankruptcy. And some even did close. So they just opened up these big mines, some in Australia, and they had to shut down and had to sell off their sort of mining operations and the mines to competitors. What you've seen in 2020, 2020 was a bit of a tale of two halves, where the first half, again, that price pressure on lithium especially was there. But as you saw this big push, this green revolution, and as we've had COVID, a lot of governments are potentially looking at using sort of the green the green push to, to come out of COVID and have really tried to apply further pressure on, you know, the deadlines that they're wanting to try and achieve, you've actually seen the price of lithium really increase. So that I, I, exactly what you're saying is what, what, we're, what the space we're in now is actually lithium prices increased, so lithium miners are doing very well, but you're also seeing a very big R&D capital investment into the technology, into the application side of battery technology, which is really going to push the entire value chain. And I think one thing to mention about the value chain is, so we've talked about raw materials, you've got the manufacturing of producing the actual batteries, you've got the application side. And that's, by the way, the application is not just in electric vehicles, it's also in solid state and industrial storage as well. So you have a number of companies that are working in that particular space. And then you look at emerging technology. So within emerging technology, things like not just lithium batteries, but flow-based batteries. Now, there's a holding within the ETF, Lockheed Martin. Most of us will know of it. But Lockheed Martin are actually working and developing a Redox flow battery. And essentially, it's just a longer duration storage technology. So lithium whilst it can hold a lot and it's not as heavy, there are limitations, especially if you're looking at solid state. So when you're looking at, you know, for commercial factories or houses less so, but more on the industrial side. And this is where potentially flow-based technology, flow battery technology will really start to develop. And so this particular ETF looks across the entire value chain. Yeah, interesting. Flow-based. So I don't have any idea what that means, Kanisha, I'm going to be honest. So effectively, it provides that a uh, more consistent battery output for a longer period of time. It's, yeah, so it's low marginal cost in terms of energy capacity. So, you know, it's 20-year system design um, life. You know, you've got the actual cost-effective duration is, you know, potentially 6 to 12 plus hours. So from a perspective of using a lithium battery, when you're talking about trying to power up a factory, you may, the life of the battery, the sort of the usage of that battery, sort of the, the pressure that the battery may, may go under, it still, it will do the job. But as I said, there are companies working on other types of technology as well. So we've got a, another 
stock in the in the ETF. It's a company by the name of NGK Insulators. It's a Japanese ceramics company. Um, so what they're mainly responsible for is the battery system. So this is in that manufacturing part in insulators and equipment. And they're actually working in alongside doing a lot of work and their main focus is lithium, but they're also looking at zinc rechargeable batteries as well. So, you know, there is more work and there's more being done on that battery technology space than just lithium, but lithium will really be the driver of the future, as I said, for the next 20 to 30 years. I think um, we get a lot of uh, tradies listening to this show, Kanish, and I think if for anyone, and maybe even just the home handyman or woman, um, anyone who will know who's used a, a power drill or some sort of power tool over the past 10 years will notice the dramatic difference between those devices made 10 years ago and those today. It's just unbelievable what you would have to pay maybe $1,000 for 10 years ago, you can now get for a few hundred dollars and it's three or four times more powerful. And that's just exciting to see. You can actually see the change of this industry in your own hand. So I guess a lot of people listening to this will be really eager to to see how they can benefit financially and play their part in that. Another one that I, I, I noticed when I was doing a bit of research on this is just kind of this whole wave of automation. Because every product that we see around our house, the smart switches, the we've talked about phones, headphones, smart fridges, all of those have to have certain types of energy storage or connections to active store, uh, energy. So these are all playing more and more a part of our lives. And, and this is one of the areas within the overall uh, total addressable market that is growing really fast. Kanish, I want to just transition now to the ACDC ETF in particular. And maybe we can just start with, I guess, the top-down approach. So most listeners, in fact, I'd say all listeners of the show now know that inside an ETF, an ETF typically follows an index, and that index may or may not be created by the, the issuer. So in this case, it's you guys, ETF Securities. You don't necessarily create that index, but you follow one that's created for you or that was already in the market. So maybe you can start at, you know, what is the ACDC ETF and, and what's the index that it's tracking? Sure. So ACDC, it's the ETF Securities Battery Tech and Lithium ETF. As I mentioned, it's an ETF designed to provide investors exposure to the broad mega trend of battery technology. But also within that battery technology value chain, it also provides investors exposure to lithium miners as well. The index that we track is the sole active battery value chain index. And that was an index that was already around when we launched the CTF back in 2018. So the whole idea behind the index is to look at both forms of first looking at the index universe of the value chain and that battery technology space. And we use a company by the name of Clean Horizons, and they're essentially a, or the index provider, I should say, uses a company called Clean Horizons to create that index universe. And they're a consultancy firm that's specifically dedicated to energy storage. And that essentially looks at this whole idea of what needs to be within that idea of battery technology space and a certain minimums that are around that as well. On the mining side, there is a database that they use for primary lithium producers as well. Now, that universe is created and reset every November, and the underlying index is rebalanced every May and November and aligning itself with certain rules. Now, these rules are essentially, you know, there has to be a minimum market capitalization. So each stock has to have a minimum market cap of US $200 million. Each stock has to be trading at least a million dollars a day. And importantly, actually, is each stock within the index cannot be classified as energy in terms of, so there's a classification company called FAXA, and they will classify each uh, sort of each stock based on where their sort of revenue, where they sit. So there is no energy stocks essentially within this particular ETF. So it's very much looking at the sectors of industrials, materials, consumer discretionary, and information technology. So that means that it would, yeah, because a lot of the companies that get caught up in that energy sector or category tend to be things that producing oil, nuclear energy, just it's like this big generalized market. And you probably don't want, you want the, if you're buying an ETF like ACDC, you want specific focus on that one subsector, if you like, or that, that niche market to an extent. 
So it makes a lot of sense. I didn't know that that was the way the universe was constructed, you know, on that 12 month basis. You mentioned before that Tesla, you know, the weight was around at the time of recording, it's between four and 5% of the ETF. So, and is it about 30 stocks that go into the, the ETF? Yeah, that's right. So it's 31 at the moment. Um, there's 31 names. Now, when when that rebalance, so I mentioned that it rebalances twice a year in May and November. When it rebalances, actually, the portfolio is rebalanced back to an equal weight. So within those 31 names, each stock has an equal representation in the portfolio. Why is that important? Again, it comes back to that idea of as an ETF provider, we're wanting to find an index, especially on a thematic that doesn't choose just the largest company because then basically weights that company by its size and what that's the market cap weighted methodology is when you essentially have, if we had 31 names, it would be the biggest company in there, which at the moment I'd say is probably Tesla, would have the largest weight. You know, We don't want that when we're looking at a thematic. What we want is each company to have an equal representation and contribution to the portfolio. So every May and November, Portfolio is reweighted back to an equal setting, and therefore you come out with you know Tesla at the moment having four point six percent. So it's not as much as large as what people may people may be more comfortable with that, and that's something that you know we're very fundamentally aware of. I was just going to add just one quick thing, just on that country as well. So we sometimes focus so much on Tesla that people think, well, I'm buying a battery technology thematic, I'm buying ACDC, am I just getting US listed stocks? It is a global portfolio. So the largest country allocation is actually Japan in 27.4%. You've got South Korean stocks, Australian names, US names, Chinese, European names. So it is not just one particular country. And that's the other thing is this particular mega trend this particular thematic is really evolving very fast that it's you can't just be focused on one particular country it's it's really a global push and you're seeing global companies involved yeah i'm glad you brought that up because it's actually something that we we noticed in our research is that if you try and build a portfolio let's say you try and build a core and a satellite portfolio in the core you have a lot of vanilla etfs like index funds and whatever and then you have this tactical portfolio which is a bit more you know focusing on these mega trends or if you just go straight for a thematic portfolio and you just pick your five or 10 favorite ETFs that are focused on particular markets, what you often end up with, at least here in Australia, is you often end up with a portfolio of ETFs that then in turn are invested mostly in the US. And in particular, there are some ETFs out there that kind of slice and dice the market in such a way that the same stock can be held in like four or five different ETFs that you own. Whereas this one, what we liked about it is that it wasn't that. It actually differentiated between a lot of the different companies and it gave you that very pure exposure to what you're looking for. So I, I really like it for that reason. It's At the time of recording, we're recording this in uh, mid to early Feb, this seems to be about $125 million invested in ACDC. That's right. Yeah, We've seen quite a lot of interest in sort of the last quarter of 2020. And as we've started to push into 2021 as well, we've started to see a real big interest in this particular ETF. I think in this idea of what I mentioned earlier, the post-pandemic recovery, sort of world governments are starting to look at this green stimulus program supporting you know, that idea of, in particular, transport electrification. So this whole idea of this thematic is going to be driven by electric vehicles. So in 2015, you saw mainly portable electronics, your mobiles, your laptops, et cetera, being the main demand on battery growth by you know where we sit now, electric vehicles are the bulk of that demand. It's only going to increase, as I said. I think you know, when talking about Joe Biden and you know, he's now come in as, as a US president, he's, he's looking to, I think he if he hasn't already, but you know, the US is going to rejoin the Paris Agreement. He's wanting to really focus on this sector and try to roll out 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations and, you know, making all federal fleets fully electric. The biggest thing about this is, you know, with global emissions and the Paris Agreement, the idea that they're trying to achieve that two-degree goal and sort of move towards a net zero by 2070 in terms of sort of global emissions, that's going to be white 
a big push. And to some extent, we're actually seeing probably they may not be able to achieve it because if you consider that two degree pathway in terms of global temperatures, you would need to have roughly, and you know, emissions from basically transport sector are one of the biggest contributors to global emissions. You would need to have about 900 million plug in vehicles would need to be on the road by 2040. And in 2019, there was only 10 million. So it comes down to two things. It's the R&D, the government initiatives, the corporates investing, private investors that are investing in furthering and producing technology and, and developing. It comes down to the cost, the raw materials, and also the cost of the total vehicle and the consumer saying, am I going to actually buy this vehicle? And that's where there's that inflection point. So there's a belief that by about 2027 and the late 2028, you'll actually see the cost of lithium batteries start to fall quite significantly where it'll be achievable to produce, you know, low-cost electric vehicles. But then you think about the total cost of ownership and they actually think it's going to be a bit earlier in about 2023, 2024, where the total cost of an electric vehicle ownership, including all the lifetime electrical costs, electricity costs, the subsidies that the governments may provide, et cetera, will be much will be better than owning a petrol vehicle and having the fuel costs and the the maintenance that that goes with having a petrol vehicle. That's fascinating. I think it's something that people tend to underestimate or just simply don't know is that electric vehicles often um, require much less maintenance than um, combustion or, you know, petrol diesel engines. Um, So that's something to keep in mind too. For anyone that's thinking of buying a a Tesla, um, feel free to Give Kanish and I a, a, a ride around it, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's it actually is a it's a fascinating thing. And to be honest, Kishna, I, I often think you know I try and take a glass half full approach. Ten million to nine hundred million—that's a pretty steep curve. But you know, if the optimist in me s- says that if we do have that cohesion in government and we do see the the top down kind of economics make more sense as well as the bottom up from more efficiency. I'd love to see us take strides and I think we can really give that a nudge. One of the things circling back to when you said Japan being the biggest allocation for the ETF, through some of my research on the industry, what it seems to show is that the Asia Pacific region is actually going to lead the charge for these types of batteries, the lithium ion batteries, because of the growth we're seeing in the the middle class throughout the region, but also in terms of manufacturing and just general economic strength as well. And I I can't help but think that um, over in America, they wouldn't want to be second best when it comes to batteries and and technology in that respect. So hopefully it heats up in a good way. And as investors, we can benefit from that. Before we get to the end of the conversation, I just want to have a quick talk about the the, the ACDC ETF. And in particular, it's got, I wouldn't say a short-ish, maybe it's a short-ish track record. Uh, August 2018 was when it was incepted. 30 stocks in the portfolio. And does it turn over quarterly? No, so it's um, every six months. So whenever that rebalance occurs, that's when okay. the turnover occurs as well. So it's every six months. How does that result in? So we t- we haven't really talked about this too much on the show before, but this idea of turnover. So turning over shares in the portfolio. How does that result in in turnover? Do, do, does it tend to result in higher turnover, or six months doesn't seem too bad? No, so we've actually seen with this particular ETF and sort of the the companies that are involved, the turnover isn't as high. As you might think, um, a lot of the companies that are in this particular ETF are really focused and are, are sort of long-term drivers or long-term sort of participants in the in the industry. So we don't see very high turnover within this ETF, which is a positive. I think what you tend to find is you will find ETFs that if you start to see high turnover, they may then implement shorter frequency of rebalances. So it may end up being moving from every six months to every quarter to try and minimize that high turnover that can occur and create sort of capital gain and loss situations within the um, portfolio. Yeah. And so for, for, for listeners, um, what Kanish and I are talking about here is um, effectively when positions uh, are entered or exited by the ETF, it can actually create or it can crystallize tax events. So we try and find ETFs that aren't at the really pointy end. So it's, you know, that medium to low turnover is ideal. So ETF issuers like Kanish will actually go in and look at that and try and minimize that if they can. So that's an important thing to keep in mind because it's not really something that's disclosed when you look at performance or anything like that. 
I was going to say, you, just with the rebalancing as well, you want to, you know, from our perspective, we want to make sure because if we're starting at an equal footing, it's 30 stocks, you know, it's very rare for a stock to really be an outlier in this particular portfolio. And that's where the other side of the rebalancing occurs is we're wanting investors when they're investing in this to be invested in what the primary goal of the index was, which was to provide a diversified portfolio on battery technology and lithium. If you ended up not rebalancing at all, you could end up with a portfolio that was very much skewed towards one stock or one particular type or area of this particular thing. And that's not what the idea is. You don't want to miss out because, and that's uh, through the equal weighted approach too. There is, I guess, the one downside of an equal weighted approach is that it can produce high volatility at times because you have more exposure to smaller and medium sized companies. But again, you do have that flaw with the 200 mil market cap. Um, as opposed to a normal or traditional index, which has the largest companies. But oftentimes in fast-moving industries, it's not always the largest companies that have the most innovation. So we see that all the time, particularly in the world of technology. So that's really interesting. Akinish, for those people who don't know, how can um, they invest in the ETF? So anyone that can access you know, via their via financial planner or stockbroker or any online brokerage platform can invest and can trade um, ASX stocks. You essentially can trade a the ACDC ETF. It's listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, so it's available for any Australian investor to do so. Mm-hmm. And I want to just add a, a disclaimer here too, guys. For, for everyone that's listening, Kinnish and I are talking here about the ACDC ETF. We've had other uh, episodes in the past. We've talked about building a portfolio thinking about risk profiles or where ETFs should sit in your portfolio. So this is not us saying that this is, you know, 100% go and invest in this and it's going to be a great time. What we're talking about here is just kind of the merits of the industry at large. It's always important to go to the ETF securities website, read the product disclosure statement or speak to your financial advisor before you invest. Kanish and I just love to talk about investing and bring that to you. So that's why we're doing it today. So always consider the risks before you invest. Kanish, I'm going to catch you off guard with one last question. You can't really prepare for it, so I can't say you're ready for it. But um, you, you talk about ETFs all day long. You're constantly talking to advisors, institutions, investors like me. What's your favorite ETF to talk about? So we're not saying like which one's going to perform the best, but your favorite ETF to talk about, which one is the one that gets you the most excited? Well, I uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky question because for me and even when I look at personally at my own, how I would build, how I, how I invest myself, you know, Benef- I, I, I don't have one. Um, you know, I, 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 look, I, I really like the idea of our future present range, which is where ACDC sits within this range of five ETFs that we have and they're looking at the future and, and the, uh, of basically the, the world. So in terms of battery technologies, the Matic or we've got a Robo ETF or a FANG ETF that looks at the biggest you know, growth industrial companies in technology. I really like the idea of where that sits you just talked about we're not and exactly right we're not suggesting anyone should just buy this etf and obviously the past performance is no indicator of the future performance but what i would say is for an investor looking at mega trends or thinking how is the world going to be disrupted and where are we going to end up being in 2015 how can i take advantage of that well then for me this is exciting because it gives people exposure to what the future could look like and benefiting from a, a financial standpoint as well from that that development. So that that's for me is the exciting part. Um, but yeah, it is quite hard to, to pick just one um, at ETF, but it, it is exciting to, to, to have a range of options, you know, from gold to, you know, the thematics to yield to emerging markets, et cetera, within the range. Yeah. It's like uh, trying to uh, pick, pick your favourite child. Yeah, I don't exactly. think... I don't think you can say that publicly, mate. So uh, I think <laughs> no, you're pretty not. well to answer that. <laughs> Kenneth Chug from ETF Securities, thanks for taking the time out to join me on the show as always, mate. And I look forward to speaking about another ETF next time. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at risk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. 
Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. Thank you.